Good morning. Good morning. Uh, welcome to St Catharines. Uh, my name is Tim Carter. I'm the vicar here at St Catharines and at All Saints in Wellington. I'm going to be leading my preaching this morning at our service of morning prayer. Um, all the words for the prayers that we will use are in the books, the books of common prayer that you have. Um, I think yours are blue rather than my red one. And morning prayer does start on page one. Um, but page one comes about there for those of you who aren't familiar with the Book of Common Prayer because it's got lots of appendices at the front. When it comes to sharing our psalm, we're going to read together Psalm 96, which is on page 469, so you might want to put a bookmark in that. Psalm 96 on page 469. Otherwise, I will announce the hymns as we go through and the page numbers that we are on. <coughs> Just as we gather, um, you'll have notice sheets that you've picked up. You'll notice that quite a lot of the things that are on the notice sheet for this week happened yesterday. Um, so <laughs> don't worry about those. Um, one thing I've been asked to highlight that isn't on the notice sheet is that uh, we have got a little flower rotor going now uh, here at St. Catherine's. <laughs> Albert's laughing at me. <laughs> <laughs> because yesterday, for those of you who came to the vicarage for our tea party, Joan very kindly bought me some flowers, which was lovely. And I put them in a vase, and I thought that was pretty good. But um, other flower arrangers around didn't think it was, I could claim much. So I am not putting myself forward to go on the flower arrangement. But if that is what you're into, if you are good at that, not me, um, it's actually more of a sign-up sheet than a rotor, to be perfectly honest, and it's in the foyer out there, so ask him or Yvonne where it is, I'm sure they'll point you in the right direction if you'd like to be part of just decorating the church with flowers for our services. I think that was everything. So, let's pray together. Father God, thank you for bringing us here this morning. Thank you that we can come and worship you, pray together, and listen to your word. We pray that by your Holy Spirit we would know your presence with us. Amen. Amen. Our first hymn is number 265, or Hail the Power of Jesus' Name, number 265. <laughs>
turneth away from his wickedness that he hath committed, and doeth that which is lawful and right, he shall save his soul alive. Dearly beloved brethren, the scripture moveth us in sundry places to acknowledge and confess our manifold sins and wickedness, but we should not dissemble nor cloak them before the face of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, but confess them with an humble, lowly, penitent and obedient heart, to the end that we may obtain forgiveness of the same by his infinite goodness and mercy. And although we at all times ought to humbly acknowledge our sins before God, yet ought we most chiefly so to do when we assemble and meet together to render thanks for the great benefits that we have received at his hands, to set forth his most worthy praise, to hear his most holy word, and to ask those things which are requisite and necessary, as well for the body as the soul. Wherefore, I pray and beseech you, as many as are here present, to accompany me with a pure heart and humble voice, unto the throne of the heavenly grace, saying with me, Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred, strayed from thy ways like lost sheep, we have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done. And we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And there is no help in us. For thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare thou them, O God, which confess their faults. Restore thou them that are penitent, according to thy promises, declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life, to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who desireth not the death of a sinner, but rather that he may turn from his wickedness and live, and hath given power and commandment to his ministers to declare and pronounce to his people, being penitent, the absolution and remission of their sins. He pardoneth and absolveth all them that truly repent and unfeignedly believe his holy gospel. Wherefore, let us beseech him, to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, those things may please him which we do at this present, and that the rest of our life hereafter may be pure and holy, so that at the last we may come to his eternal joy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And we pray together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. O Lord, open thou our lips, and our, and our mouth shall show forth thy praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Please stand. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Praise ye the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. We join together in singing the Venite.
96, which is on page 469. And we will read this together. Psalm 96, on page 469. O oh, sing unto the Lord a new psalm. Sing unto the Lord all the whole earth. Sing unto the Lord and praise his name. Be telling of his salvation from day to day. Declare his honour unto the heathen, and his wonders unto all people. For the Lord is great, and cannot worthy be praised. He is more to be feared than all gods. As for all the gods of the heathen, they are but idols. It is the Lord that made the heavens. Glory and worship are before him. Power and honour are in his sanctuary. Ascribe unto the Lord, O ye kindreds of the people, ascribe unto the Lord worship and power. Ascribe unto the Lord the honour due unto his name. Bring presents and come into his courts. O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Let the whole earth stand in awe of him. Tell it out among the heathen that the Lord is king. And that it is he who hath made the round world so fast that it cannot be moved, and how that he shall judge the people righteously. Let the heavens rejoice, and let the earth be glad. Let the sea make a noise, and all that therein is. Let the field be joyful, and all that is in it. Then shall all the trees of the wood rejoice before the Lord. For he cometh, for he cometh to judge the earth, and with righteousness to judge the world, and the people with his truth. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Please be seated as we have our first Bible reading. The reading is taken from Kings. You can find this on page 319 in your Pew Bible. Kings 1, 19, 1 to 4, page 319. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. And Jezebel sent his messenger to Elijah, saying, So may the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid, and he arose and went for his life, and came to Bathsheba, which belonged to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came to, and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second, oh, hold on. Our second hymn is number 420. Now the words may not look familiar, but we've got a familiar tune for it. So it's number 420, in Christ there is no east or west. If you're comfortable to do so, please stand as we sing.
seated for our second reading. The New Testament reading you can find on page 178 in the New Testament section of the Pew Bible, and it's taken from Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 3, verses 23 to the end. Galatians 3, verse 23. Now before faith came, we were confined under the law, kept under restraint until faith should be revealed, so that the law was our custodian until Christ came, that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a, under a custodian. For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring heirs according to promise. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As we gather around the written word and listen to the spoken word, may we meet with the living word, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Um, just a note before I get into what I'm going to, the main bit of what I'm going to say is I could find no way of um, organically linking the Old Testament and the New Testament readings today, so I'm not going to touch on Elijah particularly. It's a very short four verses in the middle of kind of four chapters of a really long story. So if you want to know more about what was going on with Elijah and why he was in such distress and what was going on, go back, a bit of homework, read through from 1 Kings about kind of 17 or 18 all the way through to the end of 1 Kings, and you get a much better overview of what was happening with Elijah. But for this morning, we're going to focus on Paul's letter to the church in Galatia. I wonder how your family or friends can tell that you're upset. Are you the kind of person who goes quiet, doesn't say very much, or do you shout? Do you uh, make it, let everybody know that something's not right in your world? Now, the Christians in Galatia who'd received this letter from Paul, they would have been in no doubt that Paul was upset. It is, in short, quite a grumpy letter. If you uh, read through it, you get this sense that Paul, is, he's, he's more than grumpy, he's beside himself at the way in which the Christians in that church, in that place, have got themselves sidetracked by Jewish religious rules. He says things like this, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? I wish I were present with you now. You could, I could change my tone, for I'm perplexed about you. I wish that those who unsettle you would go and castrate themselves. And those kind of are dotted all the way through the letter. Paul is really upset. But why is he so upset? Well, it does seem that there is an element of personal hurt in this. Paul feels that his friends have come to doubt him and his ministry and that's painful for him. Uh, but there is more than this. Paul is concerned for the people. He's led them to faith. And he's concerned now that they're being distracted. They're being led astray. That they're losing their focus on the key things that he'd taught them about Jesus. And he sees great danger for him. And so his warnings are loud and clear. He pulls no punches because what he believes what he has to say is really important for their ongoing faith and the health of that faith. So what, what is the way in which these people are being led astray? What's gone wrong? Well, again, if you read through the whole letter, it becomes apparent that some people had come to Galatia. Paul, Paul had planted the church. He told them about Jesus. He'd started the church. Then he had gone on 
as was his wont on his journeys to take the gospel elsewhere. And other people had come to Galatia and they began to teach that Christians had to obey the Jewish law, particularly with regard to circumcision and keeping of the festivals and Sabbath and those kind of things. And much of the intent of Paul's writing is that this is not the case. The Gentiles who come to believe in Jesus do not need to keep the Jewish law. And in today's reading, right in the middle of the book, right in the middle of the letter, we find three of the key things that Paul relies on in his argument. He argues that all Christians are children of God, that they've all put on or been clothed with Christ, and that they are all one in Christ. So let's look at those in turn. Um, I wonder if you look like someone in your family, or if you have similar traits or mannerisms. I wonder how you know. Oh yeah, that's, that reminds me of Uncle So-and-so when my son does that, or those kind of things. See, family is really important for many of us. But for the Jewish people... Their understanding of themselves as descendants of Abraham was of supreme importance. Core to their identity was that they were the heirs of the promise made to Abraham by God all those centuries ago. They were the people of the promise, the children of Abraham. That was who they were, core to their identity and self-understanding. But this was challenged from the very beginning of the preaching of the good news about Jesus. Even actually before Jesus appears on the scene. If you go back and have a look in Luke's account of the good news of Jesus, in chapter 3, he talks about John the Baptist, who's preparing the way for Jesus. And he's saying to those who come out to be baptised by him, he says this, Do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones... God can raise up children for Abraham. And that challenge, it continues in Jesus' teaching. If we read John's account of the good news of Jesus' life in chapter 8, we find Jesus and he's in dispute with um, some of the Jewish people who'd been listening to his teaching. And in the middle of this argument, he says this, or we read this, Abraham is our father, they answered. If you are Abraham's children, said Jesus, then you would do what Abraham did. You see, for Jesus, spiritual inheritance is much more than physical genealogy. The evidence of being part, truly part, of the inheritance of Abraham, of being heirs of the promises that God made to Abraham, was not bloodlines, but faith. It wasn't like a... A big long genealogy, a list of names that can prove that you're a child of Abraham. It's what you do with your faith. And that, for Jesus, is the family characteristic that reveals the true family of Abraham. That is the family characteristic, the faith of Abraham. But of course, it's not just the family of Abraham that Paul is talking about. It's the family of God. God doesn't just raise up children for Abraham. God also includes us in the family. As Paul writes a little later on, if you read on into chapter 4 of Galatians, it says this, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And Paul didn't make this up. This understanding flows out from Jesus' teaching. What have we prayed this morning? Our Father, who art in heaven. We pray that way because Jesus taught us To call God our Father. As followers of Jesus, we are children of God. And that has um, rights and and benefits. It also has responsibilities that that, that come with it. So Paul is arguing that we are all, all Christians, all those who follow Jesus with the faith, following Abraham's example, are members of that spiritual inheritance, members of that family. And we have also put on Christ. It puts it in other translations, we are clothed with Christ. Now, I don't know about you, it seems to me this is a slightly strange illustration. The reason I I think it's slightly strange is that for me, clothing is something that changes every day, which, which is external. 
Um, and those two things aren't things that I would associate with the relationship with Jesus. Surely that is, or at least it should be, a permanent change that affects our deepest selves, not just our outward appearances. So what is Paul getting at? Well, perhaps a couple of other bits of writing, other letters that he wrote, can help us to understand this. So, for instance, in his letter to the church in Ephesus, in chapter 4, Paul writes this. You were taught, with regard to your former way of life, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your mind, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Now, clothing isn't mentioned explicitly, but it's that same kind of idea. Here again, we we get that idea of putting something on, a new self, um, and a matching idea of taking something off, our old selves. We get similar ideas in the letter to the Church of Colossae. Again, in this letter, Paul is writing to counter the arguments of, of people who want Gentile Christians to follow the Jewish law. Again, we get this link between putting off the old um, of circumcision being replaced by baptism and the sense of the way in which baptism brings us into Christ. Here, the idea is stronger than actually being clothed with Christ. It's about being buried with him in baptism, being raised in faith. So in chapter 2 of Colossians, we read this. In Christ, you are also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off when you are circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. So if we take those three bits together, the bit from Galatians, the bit from Colossians, and the bit from Ephesians, if we draw them together, what, what common pattern can we see? What does it seem to be saying? It seems to me that it's clear from all of them that those who have been baptised are in some way in Christ and that process involves putting off, taking off the things that separated us from God, our selfish inclinations and our sinful behaviour it also involves putting on something new, more permanent than a wardrobe change a new Christ-like self created by God so, Paul argues we are in the family of God and we are in Christ so what? Well, says Paul, if this is true for all believers, then all the divisions of the world no longer operate in our place before God. Um, And the threefold illustration that he uses here is one that sets aside the common prejudice as in the time and culture of the place. So, in the Jewish tradition and in the writings of Greek and Roman philosophers, it was common for privileged sections of society to express gratitude that they were not barbarians, slaves, or women. Those were the three things. Because each of those were thought to be of lesser value and to have less access to God's favour. So Paul says, in Christ there is no Greek or Jew, slave or free, men or women. Now, clearly, he's not saying that those things no longer exist, that there's no such thing as men or women, slaves or free, Jews or Greek. The factual differences between those groups of people remain. What Paul is saying is that everyone who is in Christ has equal access to the presence and favour of God because they are in Christ. Those divisions have, or those differences, have no meaning in our Christian life. And this teaching isn't novel to Paul. It's seen throughout Jesus' life in which he repeatedly turns around the expectations and prejudices of those around him. It is the good Samaritan, the hated foreigner, not the priest or the Levite that he commends in that story. It's the tax collector that he goes to dinner with. It is a woman who meets him first when he is raised to life and to whom he entrusts the message of the resurrection. It's there throughout Jesus' ministry and teaching. And in Paul's writings, we get this repeated theme as well. The image of the one body, in which no one part can say to any other part they don't need them. Again, in his letter to the church in Ephesus, Paul writes this. 
But Jesus himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside the flesh, in his flesh, the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who are far away and peace to those who are near, for through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. It's consistent all the way through Jesus' teaching, all the way through Paul's teaching, that all of us who are in Christ, who are part of the family, are one before God. So, as we draw all these threads together, we see the core of Paul's argument, one that he feels so important, so important he writes with passion and urgency. All those who have faith in Jesus are children of God, are clothed in Christ, are one in Christ. So, if that's true, as we reflect, if Paul's right, as we think about it, how does it apply to our lives, to our faith? Because Paul's right, they aren't matters of indifference, they're matters of life and death. So just some, some questions for us to ponder. Are we living as free children of God, knowing the Father's love and care for us? Are we able to rest in the assurance that we are heirs of God's kingdom? And are we fulfilling our responsibilities to the head of the family? Have we fully put off our old selves? Or is there a tatty and comfortable cardigan or coat that we're holding on to? Is there anyone or any group of people that we look down on? That in our most honest moments we know that we don't include? Are there attitudes to others that God is challenging us to change? To see people as God sees them? One with us in Christ. Have we ever felt or maybe even now feel excluded from the family of God? As we ponder those, as we reflect on where we are with that, I believe that we can be encouraged by Paul's assurance that all those who believe in and follow the way of Jesus are all members of God's family with full access to our Father who loves us. Amen. you're comfortable to do so, would you stand as we sing the Jubilate?
continue at the bottom of page 11 as we say the creed together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our third hymn is number 492. 492. Seated. We continue on page 12. The Lord be with you and with thy spirit. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. And we pray together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. O Lord, show thy mercy upon us, and grant her thy salvation. O Lord, save the Queen, and mercifully hear us when we call upon thee. And do thy ministers with righteousness, and make thy chosen people joyful. O Lord, save thy people, and bless thine inheritance. Give peace in our time, O Lord, because there is none other that fighteth for us, but only thou, O God. O God, make clean our hearts within us, and take not thy Holy Spirit from us. O God, the strength of all them that put their trust in thee, mercifully accept our prayers. And because through the weakness of our mortal nature we can do no good thing without thee, grant us the help of thy grace, that in keeping of thy commandments we may please thee, both in will and deed, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O God, who art the author of peace and lover of concord, in knowledge of whom standeth our eternal life, whose service is perfect freedom, Defend us, thy humble servants, in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in thy defence, may not fear the power of any adversaries through the might of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, who has safely brought us to the beginning of this day, defend us in the same with thy mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings may be ordered by thy governance, to do always that is righteous in thy sight, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, high and mighty King of kings, Lord of lords, the only ruler of princes, who dost from thy throne behold all the dwellers upon earth, most heartily we beseech thee with thy favour, Behold our most gracious Sovereign Lady, Queen Elizabeth, and so replenish her with the grace of thy Holy Spirit, that she may always incline to thy will and walk in thy way. Endue her plenteously with heavenly gifts. Grant her in health and wealth long to live. Strengthen her, that she may vanquish and overcome all her enemies. And finally, after this life, she may attain everlasting joy and felicity. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, the fountain of all goodness, we humbly beseech thee to bless Charles, Prince of Wales, and all the royal family. Endure them with thy Holy Spirit, enrich them with thy heavenly grace, prosper them with all happiness, and bring them to thine everlasting kingdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, who alone workest great marvels, send down upon our bishops and curates and all congregations committed to their charge, the healthful spirit of thy grace, and that they may truly please thee, pour upon them the continual dew of thy blessing. Grant this, O Lord, for the honour of our advocate and mediator, Jesus Christ. Amen. (coughs) Almighty God, who has given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications unto thee, And dost promise that when two or three are gathered together in thy name, thou wilt grant their requests. Fulfill now, O Lord, the desires and petitions of thy servants, as may be most expedient for them, granting us in this world knowledge of thy truth, and in the world to come, everlasting life. Amen. Amen. Our final hymn this morning is number 496. And can it be? Please stand if you're comfortable to do so as we sing number 496.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen.